Good morning, fellow recording nerds. You know, once in a blue moon, I'll come across a comment whining about the product that I'm doing a video on. And to be honest, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. The whole point of this show is to try and save you guys money. My goal has always been to let you know what gear is good, what gear is bad, and what gear is just so terrible that it winds up on the wall behind me. Now, I've done a lot of videos showing off a lot of great gear, but with how much content is on the channel now, and really all of YouTube, it can be a bit difficult to know what to settle on or where to even get started. So in no particular order, here's a list of 13 things you absolutely should buy for your home recording studio. Number one, good monitors. There are tons of studio monitors out there ranging from the cheap to the expensive to the absolutely insanely expensive. Seriously, go look up a pair of barefoot speakers and don't forget to pick your jaw up the floor once you see the price. Sadly, most cheap studio monitors totally fucking suck. Seriously, a few years ago when I did the $1,500 studio challenge, I wound up going with a pair of Mackie CR3s, the ones with the green outlines. Yeah, turns out they're fucking terrible. Monitors aren't something you can easily cheap out on, nor should you. They're what's going to project the sound at you, and it's important that they do it without coloring things. They're what you're relying on to give you an objective reference of the sound you're going to be mixing down the line. Now, thankfully, you don't have to break the bank when it comes to great entry-level ones either. The Cali LP6s are some of the best bang-for-the-buck monitors out there, and they've recently released the new versions, which have a much lower self-noise. And I hope to demo them on the show sometime very soon. Now, some of the cork sniffers out there might tell you that the most important thing a studio should have are expensive converters, but thankfully, those whack jobs are a dying breed, and really, you don't have to listen to them. The converters on your interface are miles beyond what most gear had back in the 80s and 90s, and they're more than capable of getting the job done. In fact, the best converters in the world won't mean jack shit if you can't hear what you're mixing on accurately. So make monitors your number one priority. But as always, even the best monitors aren't gonna get you far without the next part. Number two, acoustic treatment. And when I say acoustic treatment, I don't mean tape a few of those foam wedge tiles across your wall. Guess what? They don't fucking do anything! At least not anything noticeable. And neither do egg cartons. Those will just turn your mix room into a fire trap. Seriously, keep them off your wall. Now, I'm talking about those big panels stuffed with rigid fiberglass insulation. Why would you need them? Because chances are the room you're recording and mixing in sounds worse than Britney Spears without auto-tune. An untreated room is going to be full of standing waves. Sound coming from your monitors is gonna hit your ears, but it's also going to bounce off the walls towards your ears out of phase. Now, I had this problem in my old studio where I had a big bass null in my mixing position. I would mix something and it would sound great in the studio, but then I took the mix out to the car and would get absolutely blasted by how much bass there was. Mounting a couple of bass traps in the corners of your mix room is going to have the most dramatic impact on the quality of your recordings and your mixes. Not the most expensive gear, not the cool glowy LEDs, not the infinite plug-in library. No, the thing that matters is the acoustic treatment. And I would suggest that you build these yourself as the pre-assembled ones can be a bit on the expensive side. Lucky for you, I've got a video on how to build your own bass traps and I've got a link to that in the description below. Number three, the right microphones. Before you buy any mics, ask yourself what you'll actually be recording. If you plan on tracking all your guitars with amp sims, then you're probably just gonna need a vocal mic. If you're planning on tracking live drums, you're gonna need quite a few more. Planning exactly what you wanna do ahead of time can save you tons of money down the line. If you know you'll only need one mic, the best bet is to grab a decent condenser like the Lewitt LCT440 or a Rode NT1. If you've got a bit more money, you can grab one of those absolutely incredible Austrian Audio OC818s, and that should be more than good enough to track vocals, an acoustic guitar, and even your guitar caps. You can also buy a dynamic mic like the SM57 or a Lewitt MTP440 and do blends. If you're recording drums or even a live band, you can pick up a whole drum mic package like the ones from Samson or T-Bone on the cheaper end, or if you're looking for something truly incredible, try the Lewitt Beat Pro 7 kit or the Earthworks DK7. They're definitely the way to get the drum sound right at the source before any processing. 
I've got demos on all of these mics on the channel, so go watch those to see what you like. And if you still don't know what to get, come ask some questions over on the SMG Discord because we're here to help. Number four, good mic stands. The worst thing you can do with those great mics you just bought is to put them on shitty fucking mic stands. Look, I get it, okay? When you see those cheap mic stands, you might think anything that costs more than 20 bucks is a ripoff, but you have to realize that a good mic stand will last you an entire lifetime. Sure, it might cut into your pot and tattoo budget, but if you're more concerned about that than the safety and longevity of your equipment, then maybe you're not cut out for this job. Swallow your fucking pride and get your priorities straight and invest in some decent fucking mic stands. You'll thank yourself 10 years from now. I'm still rocking a couple of Atlas stands that I bought way back in 2001, whereas some of the Apex ones I bought right around the same time have not made it that far. Number five, decent cables. Same principle applies here. Paying a few extra bucks per cable is just good practice. Why? Because more expensive cables sound better. Duh! <laughs> no, 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 I'm just fucking with you guys. Personally, I'd rather stay away from that can of worms, but one thing is absolutely true. A good cable is going to be shielded, something you can't be all too sure about with the cheapest ones. This will prevent unnecessary noise and interference from entering your signal chain. If you record something and there's a fuck ton of noise in there, it can be really difficult to get rid of, even with software workarounds. And no, you don't have to buy the most expensive stuff either. Personally, I use the Hosa Pro series. They're very reasonably priced and have yet to experience any issues with them in the four years that I've been working with them. Absolutely great stuff. Number six, a pop filter. This is another one of those things that doesn't exactly look glamorous, but it's an absolute necessity if you don't want your vocals to sound like someone added a fart gun to them. Now, put your hand in front of your face like this and say P, T, K, F. Notice the blasts of air? Those are plosives and they're going to make your mic fart out. That's where the pop filter comes in. Now, if we repeat our experiment from earlier with this between our mouth and our hand, P, T, K, F, you'll notice that the air isn't hitting your palm anymore. That's because the pop filter stops or redirects the air blast away from the microphone capsule. That way you can still capture the clarity of your singer's voice and not ruin your recording at the same time. Now, pop filters aren't expensive, so don't be a cheap bastard. Stop arguing with me and just fucking go get one. If you're in a pinch, however, and on the off chance your pop filter broke, you can improvise by stretching out some pantyhose in front of the mic. No, really, it will work. The trick is rigging it up so it'll stay put. Duct tape just might do the trick. You can also get a little foam cover from your average guitar store, and this might cost you a buck or two, and it's always good to have some of these on hand. Number seven, a direct box. This one is an absolute no-brainer. You guys have heard me say this again and again, that a great direct box is a great investment that will last you a lifetime. I've been using this Countryman DI for years and it still works without a hitch. So why do you even need a direct box? A direct box basically allows you to split your guitar signal into two. One goes to your amp, the other goes to your interface. If you're recording electric stringed instruments into a real amp, recording the signal directly off the pickups can be a great insurance policy. Because if the tone you dialed in ends up sounding like crap or doesn't cut well through the full mix, having a DI recorded means you can reamp and dial in a better tone and keep the original performance and you don't have to bug the guitar player to do it again. Or you can just slap an amp sim on it. You can also sidechain your DI to your main amp track and use the SMG cock blocker noise gate plugin to clean up your guitar track in seconds. It's an invaluable tool and you can grab it now as a free trial over at spectredigital.com. Number eight, external hard drives. You know what sucks? Booting up your computer, opening up your DAW to continue working on your new project and realizing something's gone wrong. Your project won't open, your files have gone missing, or your machine just has a massive hiccup and dies on you for no apparent reason. Now this has definitely happened to me before. I'll tell you, even on major project, there's nothing more fun than having to call your client and tell them that the project they spent several days recording up until now has vanished and that they have to come back and re-record everything at no extra cost, of course. So do yourself a favor and back up your files. Seriously, a one terabyte external drive costs like what, 50 bucks? 
That's plenty of space to put thousands of files on. And yes, even your 20 minute instrumental prog song with 30 guitar tracks will be safe and sound on one of these. Even if your recording machine never experiences a case of sudden death, you might still want to back up old material that you've worked on so you can make room for new things. I have tons of these around the studio with who knows what on them, and I've done it for so long that backing stuff up is almost second nature to me now. It's a great insurance policy to have, so don't overlook it. These days I'm using a lot of SSDs. I've got this guy and I've got my two terabyte SSD from OWC on the desk right now, and it runs on Thunderbolt. Backups that used to take 10 or 20 minutes are now done in seconds. And really these things take no space at all. Number nine, a soldering iron. Besides recording, mixing, editing, and uh, cleaning up the band's drunken accidents, another skill you should have is to learn soldering. You'll start noticing this more and more as you record other people. But musicians tend to be cheap fucking bastards and they don't take very good care of their equipment. Sooner or later, you're gonna have a guitar player come in with a guitar that sounds like a fax machine rather than a guitar. Believe me, he'll be very thankful that you turned his bow door with strings into a fully functioning instrument again. And if not, you'll thank yourself for ensuring your guitar tracks aren't filled with crackles and pops. Knowing how to solder can also help you repair damaged cables and even create your own. It's a valuable skill, so fucking learn it! Number 10, a golden channel. Now, once you've been at this for a while, you might start to wonder what you should spend your money on next. Let's say you've just picked up an SM7 or an equally gain hungry mic and you're noticing the preamps on your interface start hissing when you crank the gain to get any kind of decent volume out of it. This is where outboard gear comes in. Dedicated preamps tend to have a lot more gain before they start getting noisy and they come loaded with some great features like dedicated instrument inputs, high pass filters, impedance switches, and so on. They're a great way to take your recordings to the next level. Some of them even have input and output transformers that color the sound in a pleasant and musical way. The most famous among them being the Neve 1073. Now my golden channel for the longest time was my Great River MPD NV into the Distressor. And if you wanna hear what that sounds like, you can hear it on pretty much all of my videos I did before I got the 1073 OPX, which is sitting back there now. Now, what's great here is that you don't have to drop thousands of dollars on decent outboard gear. You can get some really nice external preamps that don't cost a lot of money, like the ones from Black Lion Audio, or the Focusrite ISO 1 that I recently demoed, and pair them up with an equally inexpensive outboard compressor like the Art Pro VLA or an FMR really nice compressor. Do be mindful of what you buy, however. Not all cheap gear is great, as evidenced by the now infamous Clark Technic brand. And as far as I'm concerned, taking your cash and burning it would be a far better investment than buying a piece of shit from Clark. It really pays to do some research, and I'll suggest again to drop by the SMG Discord and ask around there. Our friend The Only Joy is in there, and he recommended that we all check out the Drummer DL241, which is an absolutely fantastic compressor. I got one, several members got one, and yeah, it's killer. Watch for a review soon. Number 11, headphones. Whether it's for yourself or a client you'll be recording, you're gonna have to grab a new pair of headphones. Whoever you're recording has to be able to hear what they're doing with some semblance of clarity. What's great is that these headphones don't have to be particularly expensive and they don't have to sound mind-blowingly good either. Most cheap monitoring headphones have a bit of boosted treble for this exact purpose. The enhanced top end is going to allow the person wearing them to one, hear themselves better, and two, hear the metronome better. Of course, that doesn't matter, the drummer will still complain that the metronome keeps speeding up and slowing down. Focus your effort on finding something that's comfortable to wear for a long time and also make sure it isolates sound well. You really don't want your vocal or overhead mics to pick up the click bleed. For this reason, I'd also suggest you stick to closed backed headphones. Open backs are great for listening to music and some can even be great for mixing, but for tracking, don't put them anywhere near your mics. Number 12, courses. If you're just starting out and you have no idea what you're doing, the internet can be a fantastic source of information. It can also be a complete shit show of morons who take 30 minutes to explain a simple concept like putting a mic in front of a speaker. But you can only explain so much in a YouTube video, and for the most part, it only scratches the surface of what the recording and mixing process actually entails. My show started out with short and to the point tutorials with minimal dicking around, which you can find in one of my playlists. But if you really wanna dive in and get to the nitty gritty of every last detail, you might wanna invest into some courses like the new ones coming out from Spectre Digital. Be sure to keep your eyes open for some really great Black Friday deals coming this weekend. And 
And before any of the paint huffers start bitching in the comments like, he's never had a hit record, or why should I buy your course, you're not even a professional. Keep in mind, I'm a guy who's been recording bands for over 20 years. And while it's true, I've never worked with a band that sold millions, that's also going to be most, if not of all of you guys as well. Look, I've dealt with local bands and their collective bullshit for over two decades, and I want you to not have to go through that insanity. And sure, it might seem a bit pricey, but when you compare that to how much an audio course at college will cost, just realize that maybe, just fucking maybe, that this angry old guy from Canada might have something of value to offer. Now, don't just take my word for it. There are tons of guys on the SMG Discord who have bought and learned a great deal from my courses. Hell, I hired a bunch of them to help out on this show's production. If you want some real testimonials, head on over there and ask for yourself. And last but not least, 13, a good chair. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Glenn, how's a chair gonna help me record? That's money I could be spending on new mics and my OnlyFans subscriptions. Okay, first of all, keep it in your pants, you fucking degenerate. Second of all, consider your health. The job of being an audio engineer involves a lot of sitting, and sitting for extended periods of time can really do a number on your health. If you guys watch any of my older videos, you might remember I didn't exactly look my best. Quitting smoking made me put on a lot of weight, and it got a whole lot worse when I stopped going for walks as much as I used to. And having a shitty chair definitely didn't help. Hell, I threw my back out a few years ago, and believe me, that's not something you want to experience. Find yourself a comfortable chair, something that won't make you strain your back, and preferably something that's not so hard to sit on that'll give you a bad case of hemorrhoids. Also, try to actually sit in something before you buy it. I know that means you'll actually have to leave the house and take a shower for a change, but if you value your health, just fucking do it. All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. If you have any questions about what entry level gear to get, leave them in the comments below, or better yet, head on over to the SMG Discord and talk to some of the knowledgeable guys in there. As always, do me a favor, hit the like button, leave a comment, engage with the algorithm one way or another. It just helps the show out, and I'll see you guys in here tomorrow. Until then, let's make some great music together. Jesus Christ, I need to turn this off. The hell? Yeah, I am definitely turning that off. I have... Oh, fuck off! Fuck off! Where the fuck is my pop filter? Oh, there it is, okay.